Oh, well, bravs, we're back with Trousered Apes, Sick Literature, and the Sick Society by Duncan Williams. I had to stop chapter three, I believe this is, because I was close to running out of camera. Anyways, let's go on. Although Pope and Wordsworth arrived at their conclusions by different methods, the one by deductive reasoning and the other, through a mystical communion with nature, the thoughts expressed are sufficiently similar and indicate what one might loosely describe as an optimistic and reverent cosmic view. The same ambivalence between classicism and modernism can be seen in Shelley, the passage in the third act of Prometheus Unbound in which the spirit of the hour recounts the transformation of man from a fawning, self-contemptuous creature into a being equal, unclassed, tribeless, and nationless, the king over himself anticipates the swing from an external authority to an internal one, self-fulfillment, with remarkable prescience, but Contrary to the views of most random writers, man is still regarded as a being essentially capable of nobility, of perfectibility. Indeed, the whole of Shelley's poetry, saturated as it is with classicism, particularly Plat Platonism, I'm guessing it's Platon, 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 Platonism, Platonism, is directed towards the idea of the perfectibility of man. This idea is, of course, essentially the same as that of the neoclassicist. Once again, the difference, the difference occurs in the method by which such an idea can be attained. The neoclassicist saw it as an individual goal to be reached by reason and self-control. Shelley saw it as a communal one to be accomplished only by the overthrow of despotic forms of tyranny. The English Romantics may have occasionally inverted the yardstick of good and evil, Blake's angels are devils, and vice versa. And with perhaps a certain willful desire to shock, they pronounce Satan to be Milton's hero, but the inversion of norms is not the same as their abolition. Satan, with his courage and majesty and firm and patient opposition to omnipotent force, Shelley, was a natural choice as their symbol of rebellion, but it is significant that they still regarded him as a hero and not as an anti-hero. In other words, in spite of the powerful reaction to neoclassicism, the 19th century Romantics still inhabited a world more or less intelligible, a world in which men could play heroic roles, partakers of a culture whose norms had not yet been seriously questioned. And this is true of most English and American literature throughout the 19th century. If a watershed needs to be defined between the neoclassical age and our own, then it is to Russia that we must turn, and more specifically to the writings of Fyodor Dostoevsky. It is significant that in Spangler's opinion, the next thousand years will belong to Dostoevsky. More cautiously, William McNeil declares in The Rise of the West, that Dostoevsky anticipated much that seems characteristic of the 20th century. For at a time when few Western Europeans doubted the intrinsic superiority of their cultural inheritance, Dostoevsky's generation of Russian intellectuals found it impossible easily and automatically to accept any single cultural universe. Specifically, I wish to draw attention to certain passages from his Notes from Underground, this book published just over a century ago, is the true precursor of what one might call the modern literary movement. In it, for example, the term anti-hero is first used. In Prometheus Unbound, Prometheus, confronted by the foul furies, asks wonderingly, can aught exalt in its deformity? To which Dostoevsky's underground man answers with a soul-searing affirmative, I am a sick man, I am a spiteful man, I am an unpleasant man, and adds that his only enjoyment reposes in the hyper-consciousness of his own degradation. The more conscious he is of goodness and of all that sublime and beautiful, the more deeply and gloatingly he sinks into the mire. 
like Jimmy Porter and his confreres, he appears to revel in his own lack of goodness and dignity while denying that anyone is better than he is. I am a black guard because I am the, the nastiest, stupidest, pettiest, absurdest, and most envious of all worms on earth, none of whom is a bit better than I am. Here then is underground man exulting in his soul sickness and animalism, comparing himself and all mankind to worms, and the taking and taking apparent pride in the fact that he is burying his soul in public, stripping himself to a state of spiritual nudity. Footnote one, he also exemplifies the sadomasochistic mentality to which I have previously referred. In despair occur the most intense enjoyments, especially one is very when one is very acutely conscious of one's hopeless position. Elsewhere, he asserts that whether it's good or bad, it is sometimes very pleasant to smash things. In this respect, Dostoevsky's character is the prototype of the contemporary proletarian anti-hero, and the protagonists of Dostoevsky and Osborne both reveal the same desire to degrade themselves, to strip themselves of all pretensions, and to wallow in their own deep Despair and self-pity, the dignity of thinking beings, Johnson's phrase, would be utterly meaningless to them. The underground man and porter would alike greet it with contemptuous laughter, but the laughter is hollow, for they are aware of a sense of loss, the loss of an idea. And there you go. That's the end of chapter three. Out of the way. Let's see how long chapter four is. Not that I'm going to start it, but hopefully it's short. I don't think it is short. No, in fact, it's longer. It's 78, so that's basically 19 pages. That'll be a two-part or two. All right, bros, that's all. Goodbye. Goodbye.